Hello, and welcome to the latest Gramophone podcast, dedicated to the Gramophone Classical Music Awards 2011, which this year are being presented in association with Steinway & Sons. I'm Martin Cullingford, editor of Gramophone Online, and this time we're exploring the shortlisted recordings in the choral category. They are James McMillan's Visitatio Sepulchri and Sundogs on the Bis label, Elgar's The Kingdom, conducted by Sir Mark Elder on the Halle label, and Delis's Appalachia and the Song of the High Hills, conducted by Sir Andrew Davis on Shandos. Gramophone critic Adrian Edwards joined me to discuss these recordings. Well, should we start by looking at the, the recording of music by James Macmillan? I thought the Dutch choir here were absolutely superb. Quite outstanding, and the English text didn't flaw them at all. They sound very much like an English choir. The choral writing is extremely hard. It demands I don't know how many hours of rehearsal, but uh, the choir asked to whisper, speak, chant, whistle. It, it is a virtuoso choral piece, a cappella, and I could find no flaw in intonation or in terms of clarity of diction throughout and the recorded sound is spectacularly good and has a real depth to it. I should say the, the choir, the, the Netherlands Radio Choir, and um, the orchestra of the Netherlands Radio Chamber Philharmonic. And I, I think James McMillan's a, a composer whose music really has a very sort of tangible sense of, of spirituality there, and I, and I thought this, this recording really brought that out. Well, the, the text of these sundog poems by Michael Simmons Roberts is full of allusions to uh, metaphorical, allegorical and James Macmillan just seems to find the right music to hang the words on all the way through that you are totally riveted by the unfolding story of these canine creatures and what they represent in various uh, biblical and historical situations throughout the hundreds of years of which we've been around Yes, and James McMillan's music, it's very contemporary and yet still has a wider resonance, a sort of popularity which is is wonderful to see for works of this nature. Well the popularity of it of course stems from the fact that he's not afraid of using popular elements but never at the expense of the greater whole. So the whistling in this comes in in the most natural way possible and it's so catchy that you can't but help be immediately taken with the piece as a whole even if perhaps the first thing you'd actually remember about it is the whistling resonating round in your mind when the performance is over. Elgar's The Kingdom, conducted here by Mark Elder with the Halle Choir and Orchestra, and the soloists Claire Rutter, Susan Bickley, John Hudson, Ian Patterson. Now, before we go on to talk about this particular performance, I think under Mark Elder's time on, on the podium, the Halle really have become a quite formidable orchestral and, and, and choral force. Well, it's quite an extraordinary situation that two of the best symphony orchestras in the United Kingdom moment are within a stone's throw of one another, the BBC Philharmonic in Salford and the Halle in Manchester. Of course sharing the the same concert hall, the Bridgewater Hall for their their big events. And what Mark Elder has done is to uh, establish a really fine tone to this orchestra all the departments of the Halle Orchestra at present, and one might extend that to the Halle Choir because they are in this recording too, they've got a real lustre to the sound and I think that helps in itself. But then there's Mark Elder's own uh, personal dedication to the orchestra. And in this recording of The Kingdom, which we'll talk about in some detail in a moment, his adherence to the score is second to none. Yes, and and it, this really lies at the, the heart of the repertoire which for which I think the Halle excel at the moment, and historically, of course, have, have done. Well, that's right. I mean, he, he, he himself has said it was never an easy mantle to inherit the one of Barbarolli, and Barbarolli's Elgar recordings still stand the test of time so well, even though they're now historic recordings, even the stereo one. Yeah. Now, 
to talk specifically about the kingdom, we had the, the prelude to the kingdom on a, a previous gramophone award-winning disc, the violin concerto recording of Thomas Seatmar. So that gave us a hint of what to expect. And Mark Elder has, has taken that beginning and, and really given us a, a performance in which the, the architecture of the work seems so well paced and so well, well delivered. He seems at all times to have a sense of where we are and where it's going. That's right. And I think his operatic experience tells in this. I mean, he, he doesn't come to this repertoire from quite a narrow compass. I mean, he was music director of the English National Opera for many years, and the sense of pace of moving this work forward is quite important because you can't escape the fact that an air of piety slightly hangs over parts of it. And whenever that happens, there's just a slight nudge on the wheel, and the tempo without being uh, pushed forward there's an athletic spring underneath it and it just moves this piece along and uh, brings it quite close to uh, Gerontius in terms of its overall impact. I did think the soloists on this recording which actually is a live performance so the sound perhaps is slightly more assessed than it would be on a normal commercial recording so when you're listening to it you need to turn the knob up a bit, <laughs> bit on your amplifier to get maximum output an impact from the performance. But Mark Hill does a grasp on structure and the singing of the choir, which has a real luster to it, is really excellent. The soloists, well, we were spoiled 40-odd years ago by Sir Adrian Bolt's dream ticket of um, Margaret Price, Yvonne Minton, Alexander Young, John Shirley Quirk. And these soloists don't quite have the personality of those four very eminent singers. But Claire Rutter certainly gives... Margaret Price a good run for her money in the wonderful solo, The Sun Goeth Down. Mm. And I like the bass soloist a lot too. The tenor has a rather more reflective role and perhaps it's therefore a harder part to put across. But nevertheless, they, they do make a very good quartet. Finally, two, two works, an, an, an earlier Delius work, a work very much when he started being recognised, and a much later work, but both wonderful examples of his craftsmanship as a, as a composer. Interesting, because both these works in at least one book I've got actually come under orchestral rather than the choral music edition. And that is certainly, could be so, of Song of the High Hills, where the chorus are required to do nothing more than to add uh, an extra line of texture. Appalachia is rather different in the sense that uh, this is a setting of an old slave song and it's incredibly moving the way the baritone Andrew Rupp puts over the words and don't you be so lonesome love and don't you fret and cry and you get a real feel from his singing that there, this is a song where hope and dignity triumph over adversity. Very interesting because of course in a similar situation with a slave resonance of that piece which was echoed many years later in Showboat, you get the same sense of pride and dignity over adversity in Old Man River. And I couldn't help but connect the two when I was listening to Andrew Rupp singing that song. That's interesting. And as we're in the core category, let's, uh, let's focus specifically on, on, on the singing for a moment. Um, in the Song of the High Hills, there's some, again some quite contemporary writing, of course, which the, the choir, I think, um, perform with a, a very evocative and, and atmospheric and, and, and quite bold and confident approach. The BBC Symphony Chorus in this recording I've never heard better. I mean they, they sing with zest, They've, their singing is full-bodied, the diction's marvellous, the transparency of the recording helps to widen out this, these vistas of both these uh, pieces. I mean in the, in the first Song of the High Hills, where in Norway indeed is his spiritual home. There's a wonderful sense of the stillness of the mountains evoked in this recording. And then when you get to Appalachia, you have this wonderful sense of the breadth of the Mississippi Delta and the plantation there and the river flowing out into the Gulf of Mexico. It, 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 the recording really actually brings both these performances. Uh, it doesn't bring them to life, but it adds a further dimension to them. And I must say that I was really struck by Andrew Davis's handling of these pieces. He's got a very natural way with this music that 
ebbs and it flows, the sections join up, it doesn't come, neither work comes across as a series of departments, as a shape going right through these two performances. Davis has been recording a long time. I rate this one of the finest recordings he's ever given. You can find out which recording wins the choral category when the results are announced on October the 6th. Over the coming weeks, we'll be exploring the other categories in podcasts like this one. If you like what you've heard, why not subscribe to the Gramophone Podcasts on iTunes or look up the Gramophone Magazine channel on YouTube. Thank you for listening.